by, by way of background to this session, I should say that I was born in New Hampshire, which is one of the smaller states in the US. It has a population of one and a half million, which makes it slightly smaller than the Leeds Bradford urban area. And I was visiting my mother not too long ago and the annual report for New Hampshire Community Loan Fund dropped into the mailbox. So, so either my mother had made a donation to Community Loan Fund or the fund's marketing outreach had found her. So I was, I was really impressed with the 2022 annual report, but I was blown away by the 14 pages it took to list all the supporters of the fund, the donors, the investors, and their financial advisors that we're talking about. So these are individuals, these are bequests, businesses, foundations, nonprofits, government organizations, religious organizations, and financial institutions. So I think you'll find it inspiring. And, and Yenka, maybe you could drop the link into the chat later on in our discussion, probably not now, but later on. Um, so let's kick off, Steve, with you. And um, maybe we could um, maybe you could give a little bit of background on yourself, and then Lori could give a bit of background on herself. And then we'll go back to you, Steve, to give some background on New Hampshire Community Loan Fund. Shall we do that? Starting with That's you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Broderick, for this invitation. And I'm thrilled we're on, to we're on first names, Steve. All right. Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> uh, I come from the deep south of the United States and moved 22 months ago to New Hampshire to lead this organization. It's uh, this September, we'll be celebrating our 40th anniversary. In the United States, there are 1,400 community development financial institutions. And it really started formally uh, in uh, the early 90s. The origins of my organization started first as a revolving loan fund. Um, at the risk of being the apostle for the obvious, you know, in, in America, as in many other places, there was too much money in one place and not enough money in the other. And so the whole idea was, how do you create a revolving loan fund um, that can solve problems that maybe government and uh, nonprofits uh, cannot? Um, and, and it has a very, you know, specific sort of theory, and it was started... Uh, largely, the idea came from the idea of forming land trust that was started by World War II conscientious objectors. And the idea of these loan funds were really people that were too young to march in uh, the American civil rights movement or the women's movement, uh, but they very much were inspired by that and had the idea of how do you translate you know, uh, those political movements into economic justice. But I don't want to speak more because I don't want to color Lori's comments. And I think too often in these impact investing conversations, you get fund managers like me talking about what we do and the people who invest have very different motives. So I'm going to intentionally uh, uh, stop my, my comments because I think Lori's perspective is, is really unique uh, because of all the different places uh, from which she has operated. Great. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Thanks very much for that. Lori, um, as I say, it's such a pleasure to see you after, after 30 years on a Zoom on CDFIs. Um, so a bit of background on yourself, and then let's go to Steve's uh, prompt, which is you as an investor. And we'd like to hear more about your, your thinking when you made the investment decision. But first, a little bit of background on yourself. Sure. Um, first of all, Steve, I learned some things about uh, uh, CDFIs that I didn't know. Uh, so thanks for that for, for that background. Um, as Jamie said, we used to work together at Wellington Management Company. Um, I was there for 32 years, had a number of different roles in the organization and ended up as one of the firm's three managing partners for the last nine years of my career. Um, Wellington works entirely with institutional investors and uh, uh, endowments and foundations were a large part of our investor base. So I did a lot of work over the course of my career with investors that had, you know, clear philanthropic orientation. Um, and uh, when I retired uh, and started thinking, spending more time on my own portfolio, I really came to realize that um, 
that I wanted to have a positive impact in the investments I made, as well as through the philanthropy that I was able to, uh, to do. Um, I recently heard this phrase, maybe you all know it as well. If you own a portfolio, you own its impact. So that is the uh, philosophy that I've tried to adopt. Um, and uh, today more than 50% of my total portfolio is, uh, is in impact investments. So across both my personal assets and my charitable assets, I've chosen to, uh, to focus on impact investments. Um, one of the big reasons for that, you know, like many others, I have about 10% of my assets uh, allocated to uh, donor advised funds and other charitable um, uh, vehicles. Um, so uh, so it, that leaves 90% uh, and I, um, I wanted to uh, be able to multiply the impact that I could have by looking across um, my total portfolio. And it, it feels to me like it's two ways to have impact, right? There's the impact you have through your grants and then there's the impact you have to your investments. So in starting from the starting point, you're doubling uh, your impact. And those uh, impact investments I make are across equity, fixed income, and kind of blended investments such as, uh, such as recoverable grants. Maybe, should I leave it there for now? And, and well, Lori, uh, I, I'm interested in knowing, so you're an investor in, the uh, community loan fund. Are you also a donor? Do you do both? Yes, I have done both. Okay. Um, and so I'll I'll pick up a little bit more. Um, you know, I when I think about my criteria for making an investment, there are you know there are several factors that I consider. Um, the first is what challenges are there today that are investable. Because um, there are a lot that are not investable. Um, and then is there a trustworthy sponsor where I can do the due diligence to get comfortable um, investing uh, with them? Is there an appropriate investment vehicle? Uh, and, um, and then I want to understand the financial risk and return. And for me, it's about the combination of financial return and impact that, that um, causes me to make that buy or not buy decision. I also wanna know how big will the impact be um, of, the, of the investment I'm considering? And then how significant will my investment be in making something work or not work? Um, so uh, that's, you know, New Hampshire Charitable, sorry, New Hampshire Community Loan Fund, which uh, I first got to know through the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation, um, met all those criteria for me. So I've done a number of uh, different things with the Community Loan Fund over time. Uh, I've, uh, I started with a relatively small uh, kind of general purpose loan. And um, I then uh, specifically did a farms and food loan. And more recently, to your point, Jamie, um, I did a combination grant and loan in a 2080 combination. So giving capital to the community loan fund, um, which it could then leverage to, uh, to create additional loans or, or to, uh, to market and, and develop the loan itself, and then 80% into the loan program. Uh, Great, I, so, I do have some, more, I have some more questions for you, but I wanna get back to Steve and ask you. So um, it didn't take you 14 pages to, to list Lori Gabriel and some of her uh, people like her. You've got this amazing array of, of different organizations and people who are supportive. I mean, I think, I think I counted 700, Steve. I mean, I can't remember exactly, but. Um, but that's correct. 
it, uh, it, and good people sense of scale. We're a 52 person organization and our portfolio will probably end the fiscal year, you know, at around 170 million um, to, to give you context. And the portfolio has doubled in the last 10 years. Okay, so you're quite a lot larger than um, any of the UK CDFIs. And I just, I wanna emphasize that you're, you're doing that, vol that kind of volume, that level of support and that volume of lending in a, in a population of one and a half million. So it's, that's the piece that's really, really intriguing. So here's, so my query question is, mm -hmm. how does the Community Loan Fund reach people like Lori and then other organizations. Talk to us a little bit about how you reach all these different stakeholder groups. Yeah, there, there are two things. I mean, the one is the standard things that any organization would do. Um, you know, we, we uh, target uh, mothers and send them annual reports that have uh, sons in the impact investing world. You know, we have a very concerted program to do that. And, you know, we do the emails, the mailings, and, you know, we, we, you know, we write, you know, for publications and we appear at events, um, you know, where like-minded uh, people are. Uh, but I'd say the thing that we really do differently, and I think the, the reason that we have this pool of investors is um, we do a lot of bus tours. I am nowhere near as eloquent as our borrowers are. And I don't think you really understand, like a farm and food, you don't really understand the dilemma of how you save family farms and how you build a resilient local food shed, unless you're actually on a farm and you can understand the economics and you can see the scale. I mean, farming is dirty and it's hard on the best days. And uh, for some of our other work, you can say, you can look, I think in our industry, when we, we talk about what the impact of our portfolios, we look at raw numbers. You know, if I, let's say that I, I help you build a business and you can say, Steve, you know, you made a loan to Steve and he created three jobs. Well, if you actually go into that workplace and you realize that there are three people that maybe, uh, you know, uh, have been justice involved, that's a American language for people that have had been to prison in America, you know, there, there's a certain number, of, if you look at who goes to prison, they tend to be people who grew up in disinvested communities or people of color. So if you can sort of see people that maybe had barriers to getting employment and you sort of understand, you know, uh, how their lives became fully realized, even though they have a prison record, you know, those sort of experience we find uh, helps uh, greatly. So we, we try to shrink the distance between you know, our investors and our work. Last year in our legislature, you know, our, our provincial parliament, there was a bill that would have damaged um, our key program and would have really negatively impacted the ability of people with low wealth to buy homes. And in response, 400 of our borrowers and supporters got very politically active in terms of reaching out to their people in the, in, in the state uh, governing body and also showed up in the legislature, you know, wearing shirts and, and that presence, we didn't kill every part of the bill, but we killed the most damaging parts and it really sent a signal. And I think one of the things that I think differentiates us from many of the other CDFIs in the United States is one, this investor pool, that the great preponderance of CDFIs in the United States get their money from the Department of Treasury and from large banks, meaning when treasury rates go up, you know, central, when the central bank raises rates, their rates go up and it does to their borrowers. And when they go down there, they, they get to lower their rates. When interest rates are very low, our, our cost of funds, the rates that we paid our investors was, was higher than they could get from the central bank. Um, but our rates to our borrowers were, you know, were probably higher than the, the very low rate banks charge. But now that interest rates from our central bank are very high and banks are very high, our rates have stayed flat. And, and that's really what's unique, you know, about this is that, you know, um, uh, in, in flush times, you know, our investors will take a, a lower rate of return 
um, uh, but, you know, in exchange for higher impact, but they also have a 40 year track record that, you know, in our largest portfolio, we haven't had a single default in, in, in 40 years. Um, and then, you know, the rest of our portfolio, you know, where our not accrual rate, um, you know, in very difficult times can get up to 6%, our actual default rate is less than 2%. Um, you know, and how we do that is a, is a key part of our uh, success. And it's one of our, also one of our challenges. And I think, you know, Lori, you know, is probably on the, is obviously on the more sophisticated end of the spectrum for our investors. Um, but I think a lot of our investors, you know, uh, want a good combination of return. Um, uh, for example, our first investor uh, was the Sisters of Mercy, uh, a convent. And we have their, you know, their investment in the retirement fund. And the first CDFI I went to, their first investment was also for the same nun, Sister Kareen, who was the same investor uh, for uh, the community loan fund when it started 40 years ago. So basically I'm saying that all of my career has sort of uh, been, you know, with the shadow of the Sisters of Mercy. That's fantastic. So um, I should just clarify for this audience that <clears throat> Most of your business is in housing, so it's largely about affordable homes in the form of mobile homes, which is quite common, a qu common format for low cost housing in the US. And I think so. And so that's obviously quite a difference between a CDF, CDFI, well, the, your CDFI and the CDFIs in the UK that do not do real estate lending. So, but, but you also do enterprise lending and you do uh, minority enterprise lending, which is interesting. And I'd like to come back to that. But just to clarify that what we're trying to explore here is not, you know, we're not trying to replicate the business model of real estate lending. Right. We're really trying to understand basically how you develop a community of supporters. So for that, I want to go back to Lori and ask you, how, how does the loan fund stay in touch with you? How does it engage you? So how do you feel that like that you're part of this community as opposed to this having been a, in a transaction. What, how do they, how do they do it and what do they do well? And what do they, yeah, what do they do well? <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Um, yeah, so it's, it gets back a little bit to the fact that New Hampshire is really a small state. And so uh, the whole kind of uh, philanthropic community knows each other reasonably well. Um, in the case of this 2080 investment and, and loan that I made or grant that I made, you know, Steve personally came to see me and we, we did a nice hike together and, and, you know, and talked about um, this uh, loan that he was trying to put together um, to prevent private equity uh, buyers from, um, from jumping in on four uh, mobile home parks, uh, including one that was in the next town over from me. So, so the first thing is, you know, the, the personal connection that you can have uh, in a relatively small place. And then, you know, Steve mentioned this earlier, after the deal was done, um, we had uh, a, um, a webinar uh, with, some of the, um, with some of the recipients uh, who were able to then buy their homes, you know, speaking about what a difference that made uh, to them. Our local newspaper had stories about how that had impacted those individuals and, um, and their lives. And uh, yeah, so there's a, there's a pretty small circle but I would say the communication and the ongoing communication is what really uh, has tied me into these types of investments. And Lori, do you talk to other donors and investors or do you, do you have a, a bilateral relationship with the community loan fund? Um, I would say it's primarily bilateral, but there uh, in, I have gone to... Um, seminars or, or talks that the community loan fund has held um, where I can interact with other, with other investors. Okay. And, uh, and Steve, the, I mean, one of the things you mentioned to me earlier was that you, um, you try to get your organization to reflect the communities that you're serving. Can you talk a little bit about that? 
Yeah, thanks. And I, I'm not saying it's the only way to do it. You know, I've worked at different organizations where, uh, you know, people went to, you know, a small number of, you know, universities and all had very similar backgrounds. Our working thesis for this organization is that we need to reflect the communities in which we work. And, uh, you know, this year we've added six new language competencies because while New Hampshire is 88% uh, white, um, there are a lot of new Americans that have, that have entered the state and uh, they need to, they need, they want to start businesses. They, they want to buy homes and it's important they have someone who speaks their language. And for us to do work in communities of color, uh, because the, the American banking system has had such a history of, uh, you know, systematic uh, uh, bad banking for people of color, it's really important people see someone who looks like them across the table. So, you know, we've made, we've been very intentional about diversifying our staff. And we also have the, the, the vast majority of my staff uh, come from low wealth communities. Um, and so they have a lot of currency there. And our board, we have an interesting mix. Uh, Lori isn't on our board of directors, but we have people with backgrounds that are, that are similar to hers, people that teach at business schools. Uh, but the other half uh, is very intentionally reflects the communities uh, in which we work, um, you know, in, uh, both in terms of diversity and, and in terms of wealth and also geographic diversity. And, you know, it used to be when I came, there was a, an organization where the board was in, you know, almost entirely friends of, of my predecessor, who was a real legend, uh, you know, for me, a real hero of mine. But we've tried to create, a, you know, maybe, I wouldn't say tension, but a healthy conversation, um, you know, from, uh, you know, from both types of, of communities. And I think that tension is, is really helpful, um, you know, for us to stay true to our mission. But at the end of the day, one of the great things about the way we're organized is when I was at another uh, organization that was primarily a commercial lending operation, and we got our banks, we got our, our debt from uh, uh, primarily you know, from banks uh, and whatnot, we very much did, you know, what a few executives wanted to do. Well, right now we have an incredible amount of accountability to our 700 uh, individual and nonprofit organizations that lend us money. Um, and I think that's another way of keeping us honest. Can you talk a little bit about your relationship with local government? Do they, I mean, do they support you financially? What is that relationship like? They don't support us financially, uh, but we are starting to have much more, uh, of a much more direct relationship with local government and with entities. Um, you know, this early this morning and uh, last night, I was in deep conversations with two regions in the state. The major issue we have in New Hampshire to delivering health care, if you're someone who's interested in population health, is that people um, can't, they can't find childcare for their children. And especially for single, single parent households, that, that's an incredible issue. They also can't find enough, you know, nurses and people who work in hospitals can't afford to live there. So the largest hospital in the state, which planned to open a new wing uh, in, in, of its hospital this fall, isn't gonna open it because they can't find housing for staffing. So last night and early this morning, I was involved in conversations with, with that hospital and the local, two local mayors about what our role could be. And, and this is, it, while we may, may seem like a large uh, financial organization, we're not big enough to have the impact that we want. So we very intentionally have to leverage not only the balance sheet of other organizations, but also the talents of other nonprofits and the capacities of other entities. Um, you know, there's a, a tired cliche, if any of you are bike riders or, or, or runners, you know, if you wanna go fast, you go alone, but if you wanna go far, you go with a group. And, and I think, you know, for community development, that, that's very apropos. You know, the question this morning is, uh, you know, some large employers who can't house their employees and they're also having troubles there, you know, and they don't have the, project delivery expertise, you know, to assemble the financial partners. And, you know, they're asking, you know, can they park money with us 
and have us take on some of the convening of, of the delivery people, even if we won't be the development experts. And, you know, as I'm looking at our next year's budget, you know, and I'm about to start new strategic planning, we have to, we have to add new capacities to our staff. You know, one of the things that we're also uh, very interested in is, you know, sustainable energy and, you know, clean energy. And, and we think about it, there, there are two ways in that movement it's sort of talked about. One is through clean energy production. We focus on uh, what the movement calls off takers and you and I understand as people. You know, we're thinking, you know, if, if, you're, if you're a low wealth person, how do we reduce, you know, your utility bills every month? How do we create a work environment for you where you're not surrounded by toxic materials? And so we, we have a very holistic approach to, you know, our environmental strategy. And so we're very actively, uh, you know, uh, building capital and stacking expertise, um, you know, for, for that. And it, it's fascinating. You know, when I entered the community development movement, it was a lot of uh, white men with, uh, you know, sort of uh, the needed haircuts uh, and, and wrinkled shirts. And, you know, my staff now, it, it's hard to find anyone over the age of 32. and Their, their backgrounds are, are much more sophisticated um, than sort of the wannabe Marxist who, who who built the CDFI movement, you know, some uh, 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, so it, it's it's a very exciting time, and I got to keep my running shoes on to keep pace with with my new staff. Steve, I want to go back to that example you gave about um, uh, people having trouble finding housing for their health for their healthcare workers. Okay, and and as we said, you do a lot of housing, low uh, low cost housing, which which we don't do. But I think what you described was a really interesting dynamic in which you went to an, another organization, whether it's corporate or, or government, you went to another organization and sat down with them and said, how can we help you solve your problems through the community loan fund? And I think that's, that's a really interesting observation. And you could imagine something, you could imagine a non-housing version of that collaboration, but, but it feels like that's an interesting dynamic where you uh, you don't just give loans out to people that apply for them. You also go into the community and establish relationships and partnerships with people for whom you might be part of the solution. And I think that's an interesting it's an interesting dynamic and a complex one, and one that works best, I would say, if you're embedded in the community. Yeah, and I, I think it, it, this is a terrible metaphor, but if you think about chess. You know, uh, there's one, you know, beginning players think about their opening moves. You know, champion players think about the last 10 moves. And so we really start with what's the what's the problem and then sort of, you know, there's nothing sacrosanct about any of our products. You know, yeah. we, you know, the whole idea is how do we, and the problems we want to solve are not static ones. The most important issues of New Hampshire 40 years ago are not the ones that are most uh, compelling right now. You know, we're supposed to be this incredible storied legacy organization, but income inequality in our state has doubled in the last 20 years. You know, and that's a problem that we, we hold, you know, very closely. Um, you know, this is a state that used to have tons of family farms and, and they're imperiled. So, you know, we, we spend, a, you know, I spent last week in our, in the, in the capital of the United, of the United States, and I was doing work and you know, our federal government and, and meeting with our representatives, you know, as well with people that head the federal agencies and the cabinets, you know, trying to, we like to, the great thing about New Hampshire about us being small is we can actually do something in our state that has a material impact. You know, if I'm in a state that's very large, like California or Texas, you know, I, I see some of our peer organizations, they'll, they'll do one solar loan and say, we're doing something about climate change. Well, well, they're not really doing anything that's material. They're just virtue signaling. You know, in the state of New Hampshire, you know, we have now organized a third of the trailer parks in our state into co-ops where the residents own them. You know, one of the, we've done community solar at four trailer parks in the state. What we're actively working on is how do we do community solar at half of them, you know, do fuel cells so we can net meter and how do we, and we're working with several universities about how do we do heat pumps, you know, on shoebox shaped houses, you know, which are essentially trailers 
you know, so that people can, you know, reduce not only have cleaner energy and less intake, but that we can reduce their, their utility bills. I can't solve poverty in the United States, but can we do things that sort of make the cost of being poor less? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I think when I was younger, you know, organizations like mine were trying to change the world. And I, I think in a more humble way, we're thinking about how do we make the world work for more people? Uh, you know, and I, I hope that doesn't sound old and conservative. Um, you know, but a, a lot of our, a lot of our business strategy for commercial lending is we take a very deep look, you know, at, at things like people's aging charts. You know, what is that, what is that tension between their income statements and, and their balance sheets uh, and their and their cash flow statements? And when you see income statements looking very different than cash flow statements, you really get to understand how America's public policy has created some structural inequality. So, you know, we try to craft you know, products that don't continue to over leverage those balance sheets, you know, but can help stabilize these businesses so that their aging charts are current, meaning that their cash flow statements accurately reflect their income statements. And I, I want to apologize to everybody if that was incredibly nerdy and wonky. <laughs> you're talking to CDFIs. I think they, are, they know exactly what you're talking about. Um, I think we have a couple questions. And so Sam, did Sam Bammer, did you have a question that you wanted to, why don't you go ahead and just say it and say yeah, I, I I was just going back actually sort of rewinding to much earlier in the conversation where you were talking about how you are taking 20% equity and 80% an debt. And I just wondered how that works in practice. Does that mean that the 20% is a pure donation um, and therefore it's considered a charitable donation for, from the investor's perspective and also from your perspective? And then the debt, does the debt ever, is it, is it actually debt? Is it repaid at some point in the future? Or is it is it more of a philanthropic investment that is then put towards, you know, debt capital that can then be recycled infinitely by, by yourself on the lending side? Laurie, why don't you start and then I'll chime in from the organizational perspective. So um, if we talk about that, um that transaction I did with uh, 20% and 80%, the, the, the entire thing came from a donor advised fund um, that I have. And the 20% was a donation um, with no, that's it. Um, and uh, the 80% was a loan that has, an, and in fact, it was structured with laddered maturities and different interest rates. So um, there is an expectation that it will be paid back. Um, I'm reinvesting the interest. Uh, so the money cycles back and um, you know, I'll have um, an opportunity at those maturity points to decide whether I um, re-up on the loan, turn it into a donation or take the money back. That's, that, that's a decision for the future. Uh, and it's when you look from a treasury perspective, there's relatively little churn among our investors. You know, I'd say probably 85 to 90 percent of it is is constant. But we anticipate a certain amount of churn, and then when we do our sensitivity studies, we assume something that there's an inverted yield curve with you know treasuries in the United States, and that we may have more significant churn and, and non accrual. So we 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 do that kind of practice. But what it means is that, you know, one, there's accountability that we have to constantly be compelling to our investors, you know, and, 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 and make sure that we seem relevant. But we just sort of know that there are certain people that are going to drop off. For example, um, some children, somebody, some of our investors have children that want to have weddings. Some people want to retire and buy a boat, you know, that the, there's a natural occurrence and a natural churn to the investment. So it's diverse enough that we can sort of stay true to our mission. And, and I often have conversations, you know, with some investors where they need a higher rate of return. And, and I just tell them, you know, we, we're not your people because I'm in a certain situation where I'm trying to manage our cost of funds, you know, but if I need them, they're like, you know, have me in your back pocket if there's a project. And, you know, I, re I recently repaid a, a $5 million investment and, uh, but our demand this year has been really significant. And, and I reached back out to someone and it was a 
you know, 10 minute phone call and, you know, they, you know, they, they read, they put that $5 million back just because it's, we, we've had a significantly, uh, a significant more uh, a loan demand than we anticipated, you know, for this year. And while interest rates are very low, a lot of our portfolio was getting paid down. And this thing I'll just talk about because y'all are in the same job as me. We did a, a, a very deep analysis of our portfolio and figured out who was bankable by a traditional bank. And we just said, you know, well, I care about portfolio growth, you know, more than my family and my dog or anything like that. We just said it's a mission win if people can refinance at really low interest rates. So we reached out to people and sort of encouraged them to refinance and we had that loan capital available. Um, I expected a certain amount of loan uh, of repayments this year, you know, from people that could get cheaper loans from banks, but it has not occurred. Um, so that's why I had to go out and get more loan capital because I assumed we were gonna have a lot of repayments. But when our central bank rose rates, suddenly our, our rates, you know, were, were more attractive than banks because we haven't raised them. Um, you know, I, my crystal, I'm much better about talking about the past than the future. Um, but with interest rates, you know, continuing to rise with our central bank, you know, it's a real, it's a real challenge, you know, for me, because I need to raise the salaries of my staff to keep pace with inflation, but I don't want to raise the rates, you know, for our borrowers. You know, the, if you think about a water balloon, that water's got to go somewhere. And, you know, our investors, you know, where they can get a return that is twice what we typically pay for investments. You know, I can't begrudge for someone for, for taking five instead of two. So, you know, there's a, this is a very tenuous time because the loan demand that we have now is greater than it's ever been at any time in our organization's history. Lori, let me ask you about your attitude toward return. I have two questions for you. That's the first one. The second one is how you use your do the donor advice fund. But to go back to the return question, um, is this a concessionary investment? Is it a pseudo philanthropic investment? Or is it a low return, low risk investment that sits somewhere in your portfolio? I and mean, how would you describe your philosophy on the investment side? Um, I guess it's a combination of those. I mean, at these days, as Steve said, this is a concessionary investment. I could be getting higher returns elsewhere, um, but it, I do view it as a low risk, um, low return, lower return investment. But when I add the impact side of it, you know, for me, I can, I can justify um, taking that lower financial return because I see the very high impact. Um, and I, I just wanted to go back to that sort of 2080 question that I think Sam asked. Um, you know, uh, one of the reasons I felt very good about the 20% donation from my donor advised fund was, um, was the leverage that Steve can then get off that 20%, you know, just like any bank or CDFI by, by then, you know, reloaning on that additional capital. Um, how do I use my donor advised fund? Uh, well, I, I do work with an investment manager now, actually, um, Ballantine Partners that has offices in, in uh, my state as well as in Massachusetts. Um, and uh, we, um, it, it's really, it's, it's invested, as I said, over 50% in impact investments. And then it becomes um, my, uh, my, a key donation vehicle um, for me. Um, and I try to kind of keep the assets in the donor advised fund at roughly, 10% of my total assets. I feel like that's, um, I feel like that's an appropriate level uh, for me to, um, you know, think about giving back. I don't know if it's the old concept of tithing, but it's, um, it, it feels right for me. And the thing about a donor advised fund, the way they're structured is you give the money away to a donor advised fund, which is a charity. But you can continue to out to advise the fund on how to allocate. So you can continue to instru effectively instruct the charity how to spend your money. So it always felt like a really natural place for me to do concessionary investing. 
you've donated the money away, it's no longer yours, but you can direct it into places that make sense. And that gives you a little bit more flexibility on the concessionary stuff. So I'm interested in, I mean, the UK has DAPs as well, and mm -hmm. they function really pretty much the same way. And so it's sort of an interesting environment. It just feels like in the UK, we could do more with DAPs a little bit like what you, you've just described. And I, and I think it's a, um, it's an interesting kind of anchor point for people trying to get comfortable with concessionary investments. That's what it feels like. And, and this 80-20, this the notion of leveraging, allowing community loan fund to leverage your donation means that your impact is just, you know, is multiplied. And that's that seems quite attractive. Um, Patricia, I know you have a you had a question. Before we get to you, I want to I want to encourage anybody else with a question to either raise a hand or put it in the chat. Or raising your hand is probably the most simple, the simpler one. I can see a bunch of um, CDFI CEOs on my screen, and I'm wondering why they're not asking the obvious question. And if you don't ask it, I'm going to ask Steve. But let's first go to Patricia. Hi, th thanks, Jamie, and hello, Steve. Um, I'm just sitting here in the UK, although I do come from your side of the water originally, um, to ask you what kind of incentives do you have in place or are able to take advantage of to encourage investors and donors to come into your fund? Here in the UK, we have something called CITR. Um, it's a tax relief. It's recently got a boost um, by in the budget. Um, but we still don't have, it still doesn't seem from my perspective, um, how nascent the CDFI uh, community is here in the UK. It still doesn't seem to be a real incentive to, to really crowd in, uh, you know, as much um, funding as we could, you know, as we need and could use here in the UK. So I'm just wondering what, what tools do you have at your disposal to, to, to incentivize um, you know, investors and donors into your, into your fund? Not enough. Um, we have, there are tax credits available, you know, from our state, but they're, but they're very small. I mean, it, it represents less than 1%, you know, of, of you know, our loan capital pool. It, it's just not material. Um, there are some other tax credit programs that we're going to work with. But, so why know, do they do it? Why do you have 700 people lining up to be in your fund? <laughs> I, I think because we have a material impact in the state. That we're not, you know, that it that we're, and I think because we reflect, and I'd say with my staff, I actively encourage people to. North, New Hampshire is a wacky place. I mean, it is a, it's a place where every our legislature and our state has 400 members. You know, everybody's everybody runs for office. I mean, it, there's a, it's very democratic as a you know small d democratic. It, it's it's fascinating, and and people know each other very well. So to that extent. Um, I, I actively encourage everybody on my team to, to volunteer for organizations to sit on boards if they want to run for office. And, you know, I don't ask what kind of organization they're going to choose because people have different tastes and, you know, I don't want to do that. And I think that sort of deep community engagement is why we're able to, uh, uh, we're in touch with our investors. But I think if we were, there's something else I want to talk about, that there is a, a bite, and I apologize for my dog in the background who's very excited about this. Um, uh, Gloria, Mark Gabriel just walked into my house to, to grab the keys to my truck. Um, if you think about a bicycle, if, if the front wheel is mission and the back wheel is financial sustainability, we really try to, to balance the two. So if you imagine if you only had a front wheel, that's mission. And you were pedaling really fast. Well, you're not going anywhere because there's nothing propelling you. By the same token, if you had, were all rear wheel financial sustainability and you were pedaling really fast, you would just go in a circle. Well, that doesn't that doesn't help. So we really try to, to find a good balance of, of both. And there are some loans. The first, I talked about Sister Karina at the very beginning. The first story I got when I when I joined the CDFI and I came from the the tech world a bit. As someone, uh, Sister Korean said, uh, uh, no margin, no mission. And, you know, and, and sometimes we uh, very, uh, we make loans that, that create financial sustainability for the organization. And sometimes we do loans that probably in a conventional banking sense may not 
make sense, you know, may not be as credit worthy as others, but they're super high mission. And, and we really try to achieve that balance. And I, I think because we have that balance, you know, our, we've never not repaid an investor in 40 years. And, and I think that builds a lot of confidence and, and the visibility really helps. I don't know if we could do uh, uh, what we do if I was in California, you know, and, and, and people's attentions were, were more fickle. You know, people in New Hampshire, uh, we're surrounded by several states that we bear an incredible amount of similarity, but we take great pride in our differences and, you know, passing judgment on how precious our neighboring states are. And, and I think that sense of provincialism actually works uh, to our favor. Um, and, you know, and, uh, you know, Lori talked about us being on the trail together. I mean, people in New Hampshire, I can't tell you what political party any of my neighbors belong to. You know, I, I don't know what they worship or don't worship, you know, in terms of religion. And, and I think, you know, that this is a state that really prides itself there. And I think we, we very actively work to be a, a, a not a partisan organization. So I think our financial solvency, and again, that bicycle metaphor, you know, gives our investors, you know, a lot of confidence. Uh, but it would be, I shouldn't have said that. I should have asked Lori to answer the question because she's, she's really representative, uh, you know, of, of the 700 folks, you know, that, uh, that built the organization. Yeah, I, I guess from my perspective, it starts with the donor advised fund. Um, and there are, you know, for people in a high tax bracket in the US, a donor advised fund is a really attractive place to put the assets you plan to give to charitable institutions. So, um, so you know, it starts there. And then as Jamie mentioned, at once you've donated that money, it's maybe easier to see um, to see your way toward to a uh, a concessionary return, um, given it's going to have significant impact. I want to uh, I want to make a point here, and then I can I want to go to Yvonne, who has, has a question. Um, but uh, Steve, the point I want to make is that what's interesting is that when we talk about scaling in the UK, often what we say is you need to go national, you know, to scale, you need to be bigger and national. And what you're describing is, is going small and local and community. So you have 1.5 million people and you lend a hundred times that in dollars, roughly, I think that, so, so you've cracked the code on the scaling through intensity, scaling through um, creating community rather than scaling by roaming the country. And I just think it's a, I mean, I, when I think of the, the need, um, unless the, the need in the UK is very different from the need in the US, if people are, if, if uh, people on low incomes are people on low incomes everywhere, then what that suggests is that the need for lending is, is very, very high, even in small places but it needs to be cultivated and developed and nurtured and, and going small is how you scale. I just think that's fascinating. Yeah, you really, yeah, you, you hit on something really important that I should have led with. I, our work is very relational. There's a long relationship before we make the loan and there's a very long relationship after we make the loan, but the people that we've lent money to, we stay with and we provide a lot of technical assistance to especially on the commercial side, because we're working with people that they may not be, that incomplete and incompetent are not the same thing. And so we really try to help fill, you know, those gaps. And I, <clears throat> and my prior stop before I came here, I was at a CDFI, you know, where I grew a $200 million fund to $400 million in 18 months. And, and we largely did it not by going to a million cities, but by being very deep in the places that we were. You know, I did seven deals in a very small proximity in, in Miami. And uh, for if any of you are interested in the, the music, hip hop, you know, I got to know uh, someone called a rapper and, and did a project, you know, with this one rapper that turned out to be far more successful than we ever imagined. And then we did a project across the street and then 
he introduced me to another musician. Um, and, uh, you know, from a band that for any of you that are old enough to remember a band called Two Live Crew, uh, one of the gentlemen from that band, you know, had really been active working with uh, young, uh, uh, with youth in Miami. And, and we did a large project together. And it was, it was those networks that made sense. You know, and similarly, in, uh, I did a project, I met someone at a conference who worked for the, uh, it was a Muslim, uh, a secular Muslim organization in downtown Chicago. They were trying to figure out how to redevelop a, a neighborhood that had been beset uh, by foreclosures. And they wanted to create some business enterprise because there are so many shuttered storefronts. Well, well, we didn't know how to do it. How do you lend people, lend money to people that have a prohibition on paying interest? So we let a lot of British law journals about what you do over there. And we created a model based on what you do in England. And suddenly within the Muslim uh, uh, community in, in Chicago that was uh, both African-American and there was also some that were, that had Middle Eastern origins, we had a very tight network and, and we ended up doing an incredible amount of, of lending with what you in England sort of created, the, you know, the, this double, this, this lease double buyback program. And, and it was very, became very instrumental. So I would say we tend to be very deep yeah. As opposed to being in a million places, when we pick a place, we go very deep and we're very in a New Hampshire. I mean, I think one of my challenges now is we have so many geographies that want to partner with us. And how do you sort of figure out what are the right components where we know we have the we have the right counterparties there? And generally, you need one large organization like a hospital or a university and you need city or county government you know, that's there. And if you have, and then us, like if we have those three legs of the stool, then we can probably find enough civic support um, to do something in that area. But we, that's that's our sort of working thesis right now. But it's very, you know, we invest a lot of money in community organizers, and I don't think we have, I don't know if we have an MBA on our staff. <laughs> you know, and, and it's funny, I do a lot of teaching of accounting. Uh, you know, I, you know, at least I did yesterday, but it's, you know, we really look for people that have very strong external relations backgrounds and community organizing backgrounds and uh, the, the technical skills are much easier to teach than that ability to build trust and to build networks and communities. That's a very, uh, that's a very interesting observation. It's easier to teach somebody accounting than to take a, take an accountant and have them have a feel the community. Um, we're, we are rapidly running out of time. I would just note that Yinka has dropped into the chat a link to the annual report 2022 for New Hampshire Community Loan Fund. Uh, take a look. If you, didn't, if you don't believe me, take a look at the last 14 pages and just you know, look at what building a community could look like. But let's go for a last question, I think, to Yvonne. Go ahead. Yeah, don't worry. I had two. One was complicated. I've scratched that. Uh, but I have to say, as an accountant with an MBA, I needed to know <laughs> of your 52 sort of staff or, or however you want to sort of distribute it over time, what percentage are actually working on um, investor relations in its various forms um, in capital raising, you know, keep, keeping good people like Laurie on side? Three. Three. Okay. So you've got. I, I got to tell you, no, our, New Hampshire is a different kind of place. Yeah. I mean, I think that you know, if I have to privilege where I'm going to spend money, I'm going to spend it on technical assistance because the reason we have a low default rate is that we we stay so close to our borrowers after the loan is closed. Steve, I'm, want, I'm not having a go. I, I'm just sort of reflecting that three would seem ridiculously luxurious to us. <laughs> oh, the how? Oh, that's a high number. Oh, okay, I thought that was a low number. I count myself as one of those three. And I mean, and I think we all take on a little bit of it, but there's no one who's more persuasive. Like we have a gentleman named Alan Blake, who's really trying to solve some problems about how do we get infrastructure grants, you know, into communities. So he works a lot with some federal programs and how does he bring money into communities that have suffered from disinvestment. Alan Blake is far more compelling as an advocate to our investors because he knows the mechanics than I am. Um, so, you know, it's a, uh, you know, we we technically we have uh, uh, our one investor relations person is is retiring. You know, at the end of this fiscal year, um, so we will 
have a couple people doing it, uh, you know, uh, uh, keeping an eye on it. Uh, but we think of our supporters as a, it's not, it's not like writing a check and then standing off. I mean, we, we, we enjoy having activist investors because if I go, one of the questions that Lori and I first talked about is that if we want to have a presence in the North country, you know, where should it be? And we, we need our investors to open doors as we try to figure out, you know, where we're going to open an office. And if I want to take on a project, there's a, there's a tired, another tired cliche, since I seem to be full of them, you know, when does a developer lose money? It's, you know, when they get on an airplane. So, you know, if we're going to go into another community, it, 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 local intelligence is incredibly important. And our, our supporters are, uh, are, are very, uh, New Hampshire people are known for, for being very truthful and direct. And, and that really plays to our advantage if we're going to go deep in some communities uh, that may feel left behind, you know, because of disinvestment and just because things like paper mills are not a lucrative industry anymore and they're terrible for communities in terms of pollution, they're terrible to work in. And how do we reimagine, you know, work culture and, you know, the part of the state where, where Lori lives? Um, you know, so that's a very alive, active question, you know, for us. And so we, we spend a lot of time with activists trying to figure that out. Steve, thank you for that. I mean, unfortunately, I, we're gonna have to leave a Sam Bamber's question on the table. Um, because uh, we've run out of time, and I had a couple more questions, in, including the one I thought that one of the CEOs was going to ask. But anyway, we, we'll have to postpone that until a, a future meeting. But can I just say to Steve and Laurie, thank you very much for sharing your experience with us. It's just so helpful for us here to be able to share the experience of somebody in another place with a different kind of experience and maybe a different approach. It's just really valuable for us. So thank you very much for joining us. And Laurie, what a pleasure to see you after all this time. So thank you for being part of this. And then can I just say thank you to all the participants for being here and showing this level of interest. And you know what, I, I'd like to do this again sometime and I hope we, I hope we can. So thank you everybody, thanks very much.